Hello! Today I am going to be reviewing the debut studio album by Arkansas-based rock band Evanescence. This album is titled Fallen. It is their biggest, most successful album of their career. It's seven times platinum and did so well upon initial release critically. And of course, is something in pop culture of a phenomenon. Now, Fallen is not my favorite album of theirs. Um, the Open Door is. However, I still find so many songs on this record to be statement songs, to be the most, you know, powerful and emotional things. I mean, I think maybe because I've heard them so much to death now, I'm sort of not as impacted by some of these songs over time. And of course, Amy Lee's voice is really what ties this all together. This is the one album with Ben Moody, who was a member of Ruck Evanescence up until a little bit after this album was released. And you can definitely hear his songwriting influence. And of course, he does rap in the song Bring Me to Life. A lot of these songs were released on an sort of demo CD thing called Origin, which was released in 2000, Whisper, Imaginary, and I know those two songs were definitely already composed. This album actually took a lot, like five to six years to make um, and to write, but then the recording of it all took place around 2002. I don't find heavy metal to be that appealing to me, and I don't necessarily consider Evanescence heavy metal. They are definitely a rock band, but I see it as more like symphonic rock with also a lot of classical and operatic undertones. Um, classical music is not that far removed from where Amy Lee is headed with her songwriting, with the instrumentation used. There's a lot of piano used on this record. It's all live instruments. They have a choir featured in the last song, Whisper, it's singing in Latin, which is very kind of apocalyptic and dire. This album actually kind of was marketed as Christian rock to, at one point, which Amy Lee was very vehemently against, and I definitely agree with her that she didn't want to necessarily capitalize this record as Christian. So it's a secular record. So they actually asked that they pull these songs away from Christian rock radio stations when it was released, which I think is really interesting. I mean, it's vague and I spiritual. I don't have a problem with it being in that way. I'm surprised that they you know, reacted that strongly, but at the same time, I can see her wanting to make sure that their image and brand was not they don't want to pigeonhole themselves and start to be known as that Christian rock band. So they definitely wanted to steer away from that direction. All the songs are written by Ben Moody and Amy Lee, except there's one song that's just written by Amy Lee herself. Going Under was a huge second single released from this record. And I think it's definitely a highlight. It sort of capitalizes on their big new metal sound, but then these big operatic spaced out choral movements where it's all about Amy Lee's voice and this cascading piano when she sings, I dive again, I'm going under, drowning you. This song has been described by Lee to be about a relationship that's falling apart and this need to get out of it and yet you keep finding yourself falling back in, back in constantly and diving right back into the madness, even though you realize you really need to get yourself out because you are drowning. It's actually very heavy and strong. Bring Me to Life is this iconic song. It's probably the most iconic of their career. It's one of those iconic songs of the 2000s. Um, it features electronic background with like that, uh, with like a metal rap sort of juxtaposition. Like I said, Ben Moody does rap during the bridge and also Amy Lee a little bit. It's disconcerting and it's meant to be. And it carries that sort of gothic, in your face, um, self deprecating sort of image quite beautifully. I mean, the music video shows her, you know, dancing with the edge, committing like suicide basically. And this song could be ultimately just about like someone pleading. I mean, I see this as the most desperate and forlorn song of their career, basically singing about, you know, bring me back to life, save me from the madness and the darkness that I have become. Um, anyone who is so far down the depression hole could definitely understand where this is coming from. But Amy Lee actually says that the where this song actually originated from was a conversation she had where someone just asked her if she was happy in her current relationship. And it suddenly dawned on her that she wasn't. And she felt this like wake me up inside sort of understanding of like shake free from this relationship. I never got that sort of message from this song. I mean, I saw it as like wake me up from life. You know, like I, this is a lot more deep than just a relationship. Although that has such a significant bearing on your mental health and everything that's going on in your life for sure. I see this song as a plea for help, you know, from suicide. And the music video definitely, you know, adds to that 
And I mean, from them, it feels sincere. I mean, this is, there's nothing too campy about a lot of these songs. I do, some people consider this to be a little bit campy goth rock, like the kind of stuff you hear played at Hot Topic. And yes, you will hear this sort of music played in stores like Hot Topic, but it's not necessarily campy because it is very sincere. I mean, there's a lot of story and a lot of heartfelt lyrics that are written to sort of solidify all of this sound. It doesn't feel like these people didn't actually live these experiences, that it's coming from a place of real hurt and real despair. Everybody's Fool is a little interesting. I feel like it almost always kind of goes like, it's like a country rock song or a country heavy rock song because it has that acoustic backing with the guitar, but then it turns into, of course, the crashing guitar roller coaster that it is. And this song is about idol worship and celebrity and body image um, confusion. She actually was inspired to write this song by her sister. She at one point was getting very into, you know, makeup and making herself look a certain way and worshiping these celebrities. And she basically sings this song to her indirectly saying, um, you know, you're going to end up killing yourself or losing yourself. If you keep going down this road. It is dangerous for you to constantly place yourself below others, like in a celebrity sort of way, putting others on a pedestal and doing everything because of what they do, being a trend follower instead of a trend setter. Perfect by nature, icons of self-indulgence, just what we all need, more lies about a world that never was and never will be. Have you no shame, don't you see me? You know you've got everybody fooled. It's so direct I and mean, you can hear this sort of frustration so clearly. Um, a world that never was and never will be. This is always an illusion. These illusions of beauty that the media portrays on magazines, is this is the aesthetic of where a lot of this sort of punk rock comes from, is this sort of rebelling against the mainstream, of understanding that there is something so much more to, to a person than their physical beauty. And a lot of the time, people who spend so much time focused on physical beauty have a lot of deep self-insecurity issues and... Um, a lot of stuff underneath the surface. I mean, take Instagram, for example. A lot of these pictures that you see on Instagram, they are heavily edited. I was actually a little bit mortified to learn a little bit more about the Facetune app um, because I have seen people use it. And, you know, some people say, oh, I just use it to, you know, get rid of a pimple on my cheek or if there's something in the background of the photo I want to get rid of. That's fine. But where Facetune really is insidious is it, you don't know it's been used and people, they, you know, enlarge their breasts, they shrink their waistlines, they completely get rid of all wrinkles whatsoever, they change their butt size, they, they make their muscles larger and more defined than they really are, and they become like Photoshop experts. And I'm starting to really distrust a lot of images I see on Instagram where things look a little too perfect. Skin is a little bit too glowing and smooth. The muscles, yeah, I'm not always certain that if you haven't just been in the gym, your muscles are not going to be bulging that much, okay? I know this, believe me. And so I'm really becoming weary about social media um, editing, photo editing. And this song is a complete ode to that. And I just want to play it to anyone who's like, buying into it because unfortunately I do see a lot of people buy into it. I actually think Facetune could be one of the most dangerous things about social media and I mean dangerous um, because we see a high rate of especially teen suicide and this is something that contributes to that ultimately and mental health is a big, a big issue. I mean obviously we're always presenting ourselves as some sort of performance piece to the world but is this really you? Um, and is this harmful possibly to others who do not really know you that well and may view you a certain way? Um, especially, you know, again, it's body image is concerned. It's, it's, it's a slippery slope. Look how she comes now, bow down and stare in wonder. It's sort of that eye roll of, oh, here she comes again. Like, I'm so tired of this. I'm so done. So My Immortal is definitely the most emotional piano ballad the band has ever written. But though, I, like I said, I feel like with repeated listens, I feel like I've lost a little bit of the magic from it that its impact originally had on me. But that's not to say that I still don't look back on it over time as this grandiose, larger than life and deeper than 
human language can possibly describe sort of song. This song is actually more Ben Moody inspired. He had a lot more to do with actual writing of this song, and it was based off of actually some stories that he was writing, short poem poems. But the idea about this My Immortal is basically about someone who has passed away and become a ghost, but this ghost continually haunts you day in and day out, and it constantly reminds you of them, and it's becoming super painful. You actually wish the ghost would go away. You love this person still so much, but you don't want them to haunt you every living day. There are two versions of this song, the Stripped Backs version with just Amy Lee, which is track four on this album, and the more complete single band version, which was released as the uh, final song off of this record. It definitely feels better, I think, as the full band version, just because in those few moments where the band really comes in, it definitely serves up that drama that you need. There's still a lot of sparsity to the piano and the vocals of Lee that's very haunting and beautiful. The music video is black and white. It's very contrasting. It's very dark, moody, and yet serene at the same time. But the, the one with just Amy Lee is still very powerful, though it feels a little bit unfinished, more like a demo version. This was a song that was recorded as a demo for their Origins EP, like I said, another song from Ben. Lee actually admitted that the original version doesn't sound that good to her, and I kind of agree because the piano isn't really a real piano recording. They had to break into a studio and record it very crappily because they couldn't afford a recording session. This is in like the late 90s when they recorded that original. And so she really wishes and likes the band version more because it's been re-recorded and sounds a lot better because the sound quality is just so much stronger. She has a phenomenal vocal range too in this song. Ben Moody has dedicated this song to his grandfather. Okay, so if there was kind of one song that might teeter on the campy goth rock sound, it might be haunted. I still appreciate the creepiness of it. It's very goosebumps. It's very over-the-top dramatic. It has this vocal effect on her in her voice that feels like it was recorded for a Halloween soundtrack. Um, she sings about, you know, someone haunting her. I can feel you watching me across the room. I can smell you alive. Your heart pounding in my head. That's a very powerful line. Um, ultimately, I mean, of course, this song is a lot about, like, that feeling of someone not physically haunting you as a ghost, but that tension in the room or that tension in a relationship. But it also, because I don't necessarily see this song necessarily being about someone who's physically passed away and this is like mourning them because this song is a little too dramatic for that in the fact that it's like the metaphors are really played up. It feels a little bit more like attributing gothic sort of imagery to a tense relationship or situation that is going on. There's a little bit of electronic backing to this song as well, which goes then again more into that new metal territory, which is very interesting and experimental, and I will give them that. Tourniquet is a cover song. It wasn't originally written by them, and I could see maybe why this is partly why they got labeled as a Christian band, because the Christian rock band was the original writers of this song. The band's called Soul Embraced, and actually one of the future members of Evanescence, not currently in this band at this point, Rocky Gray, came from that band. So I can see how they possibly were getting linked up into that sort of that sphere of music because of their influence. Everyone's like, oh, they covered Tourniquet. As we know, a tourniquet is a device to help someone who's bleeding. And it's this very sort of goth punk imagery and metaphor that they're using to talk about some sort of spiritual salvation. I tried to kill the pain, but only brought more. I lay dying and I'm pouring crimson regret and betrayal. My God, my tourniquet, return to me salvation. They do name drop God in this song, how a lot of people will think this is a Christian rock song. And it is. But band is interpreting it as a more vague spiritual essence of God. It's, it's not the Christian God. That desperation of, you know, save me, I'm, I'm falling apart. And the song is so forlorn. It's, it's very, very heavy on the guitars. It needs to be because this song is dark. It reminds me of Sweet Sacrifice from their second album. I see these two songs as like sister songs, even though Sweet Sacrifice is an original song. And I do think it is a lot more interesting than Tourniquet, but I see the progression. Imaginary is a lot more interesting lyrically than I think it is sonically. I appreciate where she's going with the poetic lyrics of this song, but the sound of it ultimately doesn't necessarily feel like it goes quite where I would love it to. It starts out very forlorn with this orchestral backing, and then it sort of crashes down into the familiar rock meltdown, as I call it. I mean, the lyrics are the real centerpiece. 
I linger in the doorway of alarm clock screaming monsters calling my name. Let me stay where the wind will whisper to me, where the raindrops as they're falling tell a story. In my field of paper flowers and candy clouds of lullaby, I lie inside myself for hours and watch my purple sky fly over me. This is very trippy. It's very Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds type lyrics, which I love because they're very enigmatic and poetic and overly descriptive. They leave you feeling this very sort of, it's, it's very Tim Burton, this world that she's conjuring up for you. Um, you know, a field of paper flowers and candy clouds of lullaby. It reminds me of the lyrics from Curly's Walking on Air song and um, also her song Creep Show. These songs, if anyone's familiar with Curly, I know Curly probably is aware of Evanescence. I feel like there's some influence there um, because this song is definitely employing that sort of lyrical um, style. I basically see this song as this plea to escape into your dreams, escape the world that you're constantly living in, um, and yet at the same time possibly feeling controlled by that, you know, that wanting to escape and feeling stuck. She sings about lingering in the doorway between one world and the other, not knowing which to inhabit. Should she let herself succumb to her daydreams and visions and leave the real world behind, or does she need to be in the real world and this vision world is distracting her? And it's beautiful, but it's also this like temptation that's dogging her down. I see it as sort of this frustrated sort of between two worlds, trying to understand what's going on in your head. And is it all imaginary or what is reality anyway? You know, there's this like whole breakdown in her mind. Taking Over Me is a song about a relationship that's slowly eating away at your soul. You're losing yourself as you feel like this thing is falling apart that you're surrounded in and you're trapped. And you wish that it wasn't like this. You wish that you weren't so obsessed with this person. Amy Lee was inspired because the feeling that someone else might be obsessed with you is very powerful and very overwhelming. And so it starts to take over you because you're constantly realizing that this person is latched onto you so tight, like they're too clingy. Very dramatic, beautiful riffs. It has a beautiful sort of almost triumphant, but then at the same time, melancholy sound and key change. And it is very well produced. I mean, it's got a little bit of electronic backing again, like a lot of these songs do just in the background. Hello, this is the most forlorn, melancholic song Evanescence has ever created, and hard to top in my opinion. It's short, it's heart-wrenching. The subject matter, of course, is even more so, even if you do not know, though this song comes across as extremely just full of despair, and it's, it has that gothic undertone of a beautiful, bittersweet piano ballad. Um, playground school bells ring again, rain clouds come to play again. Has no one told you she's not breathing? Hello, I'm your mind giving you someone to talk to. If I smile and don't believe, soon I know I'll wake from this dream. Don't try to fix me, I'm not broken. I'm the lie living for you so you can hide. Suddenly I know I'm not sleeping. Hello, I'm still here, all that's left of yesterday. So Amy Lee had a sister, Bonnie, who passed away when Amy was six years old. She was only three. She found out while she was in the schoolyard one day at school and ever since has been haunted by the memory of her sister. Um, this is something that no child should have to understand or try to fathom, but she had to at that young age of understanding that her sister was really gone, that she was never going to come back. I can't begin to imagine what that must have felt like and what that would feel like to anyone at any age, but especially at the age of six. This is her remembering how it felt. This is her putting this to pen to paper. And it's so powerful and emotional that Lee does not ever perform this song live. This song is like that one sort of song on the album that is just on the album. I wish she would perform it live because it is so beautiful, but I respect the fact that it is just way too personal for her to sing. I don't think she could sing it without crying and breaking down on stage or having at least a very difficult time being in the right headspace for afterwards. You create an idea of what happened and a co as to cope, but the real reality is that she's no longer breathing. That sort of heart-wrenching moment where your heart falls to the bottom of the earth and you realize that you are going to be separated forever. Her vocals are as sharp and crisp and pained as ever. When she reaches these hard high notes, they are so shrill, so 
almost off. You can hear the pain. They're not perfect. Amy Lee is not a vocalist who strives for perfection. She strives for emotion. And I've heard some people say she's not classically trained, yet she tries to sing these operatic notes. That's not the point. She still reaches them. She's not off key. She just reaches them in her own raspy, pained way. And they sound actually 10 times more interesting to me because of that. I don't necessarily need to hear a perfect operatic high note soprano singing because we know that Amy is a talented soprano, but she definitely has this interesting blend to her voice that is so haunted, so full of like the choking in your voice when you can't speak anymore because you're choked up with tears. You feel that as she's singing these lines and there's that subtlety and that softness as well. It's crisp, it's chilling, it's dark, it's mournful, it's melancholic. Highly recommend this song. A song that goes a little bit more in the pop direction with its pop electronic blend with that, of course, rock undertone would be My Last Breath. This song was inspired by the 9-11 attacks, which is was around when they were composing the theme for this song. So this is sort of that, again, embodying that forlorn desperation. Hold on to me, love. You know I can't stay long. All I wanted to say was I love you and I'm not afraid. Holding my last breath, safe inside myself, are all my thoughts of you, sweet raptured light, it ends here tonight. A little bit more open and vague and up to interpretation. Some people may consider it then it's a little too open and it's dramatic for dramatic sake, it's not so personal, but this song is a little bit more open on purpose. It's just a little bit more sweeping. It's not as memorable though, in my opinion. Um, I don't necessarily find the song I'm coming back to years and years after, but I still appreciate the instrumentation. I still appreciate the electronic production. And like I said, that cathartic choral release of her voice being blended with these riffing guitars is still a signature sound. But this is where it does start to sound a little repetitive because you've heard this on like nine other songs on the record so far. The closing track is Whisper. This is one of the more gothic songs. It employs the Millennium Choir which is this choral group they sing in Latin towards the end. I'm not actually as big a fan of it because it gets a little bit too, like, Creed. It gets a little bit too, like, if you really listen to, like, heavy, heavy metal, they'll employ this. And I, in I understand it's, like, dark, dark gothic music, but it sounds a little cheesy to me. But the lyrics are extremely poignant. This truth drives me into madness. I know I can't stop the pain if I will it all away. I'm frightened by what I see, but somehow I know that there's much more to come, immobilized by my fear. Fallen angels at my feet, whispered voices at my ear, death before my eyes, lying next to me, I fear. Because of the reference to fallen angels and because of the Latin vocals, again, I could see how this could be construed as a dark Christian song, though a little bit more in the occult direction, but it's not necessarily praising the occult sort of idea of fallen angels or Satan, but it's talking about feeling like you're succumbed to that. You can hear Satan whispering to you and you're trying to struggle with the demons in your mind. And this song is about that. And it's an early demo that was on their Origins EP. Again, this is more fully formed in this version, as does sound better, but it's also a little overproduced, possibly, for me. And like I said, a little bit too overdramatic and over the top. I feel like a song that's about whispers should be a little bit more hushed and a little bit more under your skin. And this song can, kind of beats you over the head with it. We then, of course, close out the album with the My Immortal Band version, which I have already talked about. Definitely, I think, a lot stronger than the original recording. So, all in all, Fallen, it speaks about, I mean, the title is Fallen. This album feels cohesive. It definitely has their sound. It brands them very well. Um, and it's also underneath, it's really dark. And that's what Evanescence was and is supposed to be about. You know, Evanescence is about fading away. It needs to fade away. And this, is, this album is about dealing with loss and about dealing with death and understanding that. And of course, you know, that is, of course, something that's common to deal with heavy metal and goth music. But I feel as though this time they're not necessarily just singing about it for the sake of singing about it, to be goth or campy. They're really trying to deal with these emotional things. It's a standout album, and I can see why it was so successful. Although, personally, I find the open door to be a little bit more exploratory and a little bit more fully fleshed out. I feel like Fallen feels a little bit too many, too much like demos that are interesting and backbones for something strong, but maybe could have been taken in a bit more interesting direction. And so for me, though, both albums are so strong. I have reviewed The Open Door. I'll link the review in the description. 
Um, I will review their self-title Evanescence as well. And I have also reviewed Synthesis, which was their album that came out in November, which was revert versions of a few of these songs, like Bring Me to Life and Imaginary. They're the only songs from this record that made it onto that one. Oh, and My Immortal, those three songs. Um, were reworked, and I don't think necessarily as well as the originals on this. Some other songs were better, but not necessarily as this album is concerned. But I will link the review to that as well. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this review. Let me know what you thought about this album in the comments. And I look forward to doing the next Evanescence um, self-titled review sometime in the future as well. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful day. Bye. And I have